Um, so I guess the way I was going to go through things maybe isn't in the most logical order, but I was planning to essentially take the section that um, um, sort of as it appears on the page. Uh, let me increase the size of things so folks can actually see. Great. Uh, can you see my screen? Just quick check in. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so I was going to go through the package development section, um, sort of going a little bit top to bottom, um, uh, starting with uh, adding data, which was at least a point of interest to me. Um, uh, then I'll divert a little bit and add add functions um, and adding packages, then kind of come down to adding the, the markdown template and, and add-ins. Uh, and maybe mop up some of the rest thereafter. So it's it's kind of a jumping around a bit. So sorry, sorry about that in advance. Um, so first, I wanted to talk about uh, the the adding data, which was kind of interesting to me. I, I'd never done this before, um, but I think I will be doing this before <laughs> or be doing this uh, soon. Um, so you know, in, in packages, you can not only add what you might imagine functions, but you, you can also add data. And those data can serve, you know, a few different purposes. Um, uh, so the use cases are as follows. So number one, um, maybe you want to have some data that's built into your package uh, and provisioned in the package so that in your documentation examples, you and the users of your package can understand how to use your functions. Um, so in the examples, you can execute some examples with some data on hand and then the users can kind of follow, follow along or do ad additional things with those same data sets. Uh, so you find that a lot in, uh, you know, IDR, dplyr, uh, also GT, and, and many, many others, um, I guess everywhere where data is being manipulated somehow. Um, so that's use case one. Use case two is, is uh, uh, maybe you might have a package whose sole purpose is simply to make data available. Uh, so there are a few that probably you've seen, uh, you know, in, in learning R. Uh, or advertise elsewhere, uh, you know, learning R, maybe you've seen kind of uh, NYC flights, and more recently, you know, the famous uh, Palmer Penguins data set. Uh, so each, each one of those data sets has a corresponding package that provides, you know, a set of, set of data that, that correspond to that. That's use case two. Use case number three uh, would be for internal purposes of the of the package itself. I have I freely admit I don't fully understand this this use case exactly. Uh, but let's imagine there, there are data that you you need to use within the package itself for for various purposes within the package. Um, there's one that uh, case that was kind of uh, described in the, the R packages book uh, of uh, Google Google Drive. I think it's either Google Drive or Google Drive 4. Um, where, um, as I understand it, the authors of sort of the authors of the package have essentially scraped the help docs of the uh, uh, Google Drive API, uh, have put that into internal data, and those internal data are kind of fed presumably into the documentation of the, of the package itself. So that's kind of an ex a use case of, of the, the internal uh, data. So I I'll would kind of go. Yeah, I would assume ahead. it's so it's probably not fed into the documentation because that would be. Um, different, like that wouldn't be data that you put into the package. That would be data that you need while building the package. My guess would be that they scrape it and then they have that, they use it in um, probably actually in the functions themselves for where do you find this part of the API, things like that. So URLs okay. that they need to hit. Um, and I have done that kind of thing where we'll have like an object that is the uh, so I guess backing up a tiny bit, you know, remember that data can be just like a a vector, a character vector. Um, and so it'll be, or, you know, or it can be a list or it can be a table or whatever. And we've had ones that are named lists of um, like uh, checkpoints for BERT style models that we support. And it's the the name of the model and the URL where you can download that data. Um, and we put that as data so that we don't have to update any time we reference it within the functions. We just go to the one place, update that one thing, and then everything from there gets updated. Um, and then uh, while I've got you interrupted, I've got 
these are two data packages that I maintain. I just put in the chat. And those are kind of a subtype where we split them off into data packages because it makes CRAN happier. Um, these main, the actual data piece of the package doesn't change very often, if at all. Um, but the package itself might change quite a bit more often. And so we, you split the data piece off, that might be larger than CRAN normally allows, but they'll let that through because then the normal package doesn't have to update every, or, or sorry, when you update the normal package, you don't like re-update the data that didn't change, you know, and um, having that data, every time you save data in, um, especially like a GitHub repo, it's going to balloon the GitHub repo. So you don't want that to be happening over and over. So anyway, so that's what these are. Um, and that's a, I don't know if it's super common, but it's relatively common to, to do that with um, the data piece of a package if you've got something that's relatively huge. Interesting, thanks Thanks for that, John. Um, I, actually, yeah. I, had a, I actually had a use case for this that I was looking at yesterday too. I, I have this long running function um, that uses recursion and I was trying to speed it up. And so I realized that the stuff the function was doing could be um, divided into two distinct parts and you could, I could pre-calculate the recursion piece, save it as a as a list, and then so when users would would use it instead of having them to rerun the recursive part, all they would be doing was indexing into a list, and it made it a little faster. Um, it turned out there was a faster way than both of those, so I'm not actually going to use it, but it seemed like a thing that might be useful at some point. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the use cases. This is something that's kind of completely new to me. I, I'd only kind of uh, packed my packages, if I could put it that way, with uh, with with functions in the past. So it's uh, it's it's interesting to see how this this piece is done. This uh, kind of was a little bit of a rabbit hole for me this week to kind of look into the R package chapter, which I, I'd skipped when reading the book in the past because it wasn't relevant for me. Uh, but but now this is a nice kind of forcing function to have me, uh, you know, read read the chapter. And uh, now I'll think think about how I can integrate this in the pack, uh, into future packages. Um, in, in terms of how how to do this, um, so I, I feel like this this um, this man page probably could be written differently or better. I, I mean, I guess in a sense it's complemented by the see also here the data chapter and and the. Our packages, but what I didn't quite understand in reading the documentation is, in a sense, like these are two two functions that are part of a potentially like a workflow, right? Uh, so the workflow would kind of be as follows. I'll just talk through it, and then maybe we can kind of go through it in a little bit more detail. So as I understand, is first you would you would kind of construct the data somehow. So this would be the use raw data piece. So let's just say you construct the data. Uh, so that it lives within your your, your package. You're, you're creating you're creating the data. Um, you know, and, and as John said, it could be something as simple as a, a vector or a list, or it could be a full blown you know uh, large data frame. Um, uh, then you load the data. Um, this is you know you kind of putting on your your, your uh, um, uh, developer hat. Uh, you would load the data through Dev Tools load all. So kind of make those uh, those data sets available, uh, and then you would you would. I guess I'll call it build and export the data uh, with with use uh, with the use data part. So this will actually take those data objects and then and write them somewhere. So make them available either to uh, to users uh, uh, of your package uh, as data within the package, or make it available to to kind of uh, your your package itself, the functions of the package as as internal. Uh, as data internal to the package, and then kind of last step um, is is to document the data. Um, so uh, you'd kind of go into the the R folder, uh, create some uh, R script, uh, whose sole purpose, as I understand, is is simply to uh, document the document the data. So using Roxygen, to basically to just you know create uh, an entry for each for each data object, and uh, uh, and then you know use the Roxygen tags to generate kind of a man a man page for for. Uh, if you if you so desire for for each one of those data sets, so these are part of a, a workflow. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. Just yes. that. No, go ahead, John. Uh, like it, it's kind of funny that they are listed in this order because really it's you use use data raw, 
which generates the file that calls use data inside of it. And so, uh, uh, you know, so in your file, you do whatever you have to do to create the data set, load the data set, clean up the data set. And then that use data, you just reference the object that you have now created within that uh, raw file. And that function use data is what saves it for the package, just to make sure that the, that was clear. So it, it is exactly, it's a workflow. You do the use data. I don't, or sorry, use data raw. I don't know if there is a function. I don't think there is to help with the documentation. I, I didn't see it. I, that, yeah. This was kind of my point of puzzlement is it seemed like there were these, these missing pieces in the workflow that, uh, I mean, I guess if you're, you're in the habit of developing packages that use data, you would know about, but there aren't any helper functions that would help you help you along the way. I mean, I guess in fairness, you know, you know, if you're just creating this, this R script that contains documentation, I'm not really sure what the, what use this would do for you precisely. I mean, I guess if you had all these objects that have already been uh, exported, right, then I guess it could know that those exist and then create create Roxygen entries for you. Uh, I guess that's, that's maybe what it could do. Uh, it could do a, provide quite a lot, really. To that yeah. File. yeah, actually, but now it, that I think about it, you're right. Because it could, if it's a data frame, it could like set up the, um, the uh, structure with all the column names for you to then document what do these column names mean or you know things like that um it does feel like kind of a missing piece I, I think it's partly because like you know the data of a package is a much smaller set of things uh than functions and they just haven't done that much with it um but that is interesting because it is partly you know for one, when I want to do document data, I always have to go check, okay, what thing, what fields are you supposed to, or are useful to include here? Like, how do you tag the source? How do you, you know, do all these things? And so having functions that helped with that would actually be really helpful. Um, yep. The other, the other piece is that there are just, there are complications around data that I could, you know, if, now I'm getting another idea for a, a package to go with a log, you know, for use this, but, um sometimes like if you have if you want people to use data that's exported by your package um but you also want to use it internally in the package it can be a little bit of a it, it can be weird um often i will end up making data internal so i set internal equals true which means it's not exported by the package and then i export a function that loads that data and maybe you can send some arguments into that function to load different types of data sets or things like that. And that way it plays really, it plays much nicer between uh, your internal use of it within the package and how a user would use it outside of the package. Um, would, would there be any prohibition against doing both, John? So like, let's say you have, you know, your objects and then you, you register yeah. them both as, as, as external and internal. I mean, they live in different yeah. places, but maybe that might make your life as a developer easier. I don't, I don't know. I, so possibly the, it depends on how big the data is because you're doubling the footprint of the data basically. Um, so I, I would watch out for that. And then there are other, all kinds of complications around, you know, it, there's the compress argument for use data and the book goes into a little bit about how to kind of optimize that. Um, but even beyond that, sometimes if it's really big data, you might want to save it in a different format than the usual formats and then have something that, you know, like maybe you save it in the like raw file section of the package and have a function that loads it rather than loading or saving it as normal um, as the normal data formats. So there's lots of complications around this and and really these two functions are all that use this covers and then use the use data function is kind of two functions because internal data and external data are very different um in the way they save so uh yeah exactly but, exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean i i think you kind of queued things up for me i was just going to in a few more words maybe go into the how these functions work just so um since i guess we're meant to be reading the docs to kind of uh, uh summarize the docs a, a little bit um so for the um 
for, for the use raw data piece, it, it actually does a fair number of things for you in, in, in the workflow. Uh, so sorry, use, uh, yeah, use raw data. Uh, so first it kind of creates the scaffolding that you need to create the raw data. So first it creates a, a raw data folder at the root of your, your, your project, a root of your package, um, if it doesn't already exist. Uh, and then creates uh, and then creates uh, um, an R file um, where you kind of kind of like instantiate the, that data set with whatever name you provide in the name parameter here, right? Um, so that's that's you know a few number of steps. It's it's left to you, of course, to uh, to to fill in the details of how how that data set gets gets populated. You know, either you kind of uh, you code it out by hand or you draw it in from a CSV file or something. Um, uh, so that's that's on 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 the use uh, uh, data raw function, uh, on the use data function. So uh, as you mentioned, John, it's in a sense kind of like a one one interface for kind of two functions or two you know very different use cases. Uh, and how the function beha behaves will be uh, will depend on what you provide in this uh, this argument here, the the internal, right? So by default, it's set to false. So that meaning that. Your data aren't internal, meaning they're they're public. They're they're part of the package available to the user of the package. Um, but uh, depending on how you what parameter you put here, the, the function will kind of behave differently. Um, so for the the case where where you know you know case number one is uh, you would kind of export the data as uh, you know entities that are available to your end user uh, through the package. Uh, you know you, you just leave the default here false. Um, uh, and then provide these uh, uh, provide here a list of a list of uh, object names that correspond to the data sets that you will have created uh, in, in your raw in your raw data. So let's see, let's see, df one, df two, df three, etc. Um, uh, then then you can select whether you want to overwrite the overwrite the data that's being exported uh, by by default. You're not. I feel like maybe it should be true, but that's personal preference. Um, then optionally, you can kind of decide. Or you can uh, tell tell use this how you want to compress the data. There are a few different options available. This is the default. I didn't go much into this, um, so maybe we can double back, John, if you have experience or information about that. Uh, I'll just talk about the, kind of the two other parameters quickly. Uh, so uh, the version here is the version. Um, I guess it's kind of the version of how R serializes. Uh, data in an RDA file. I, I don't have much experience with this, but it seems like uh, uh, basically um, version two will help you target older versions of R. Uh, it's I think versions, let me look at my notes really quickly. Um, I don't have the, the version numbers. I think it's specified down here. Uh, versions 1.4 to 3.53. Um, and then if you wanna use version four, that'll target newer versions of R. Uh, and then kind of last last little flag, I see Rebecca's got her hand raised uh, on, on um, uh, if, if your uh, is a, a parameter to, to say to use this, whether your data um, use only ASCII characters or if they include, you know, like UTF-8 encoded characters and by default it's UTF friendly. So uh, yeah, let me stop there and I guess I'll collect questions uh, uh, and then uh, uh, comments. Go ahead, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Um, so can it make the internal versus uh, not internal make some sense, but I don't have an idea in my head of a real use case for when you need internal data. Is there an example that you can describe from like some tidyverse package where you think there might be internal data going on behind the scene that I may have, or if you from your own use case, but sometimes hearing about other people's projects it takes so long for my brain to like conceptualize it but um so that's question number one and question number two could you scroll down to the arguments i saw I, some oh lazy data um like i'm familiar with lazy loading from databases or lazy data is this lazy data something similar in terms of so my, my uh, crude understanding on the lazy part is that um Basically, when your package is loaded, the data sets won't be loaded automatically when the package is loaded. Instead, the user will have to kind of load the data into their into their environment. Um, maybe there's okay. more than that, but that's what I, I think I, I understand. And is that the preferred behavior box. generally or? Um, that's a good question. I guess it all depends on what you as a package author want to do, but I think it's probably the preferred uh, thing. And actually, interestingly, I don't know, unless I missed this in the docs, I didn't see, I think by default, 
I forget where I read this, but I think this function uh, writes in the description file that you'll have, uh, it'll put the lazy loading flag of the true in your description file. I don't know if there's a way to say uh, um, false um, through through this function or other means. Yeah, I think because it was, it's really rare that you want it to be false. They don't even like support so you do it. that. Yeah, um, in the book, I think they go into that a little bit. The only time um, where you would probably want that to be false would be like where um, the the only point of the package is the data yeah. is all of the data. Yeah. Um, because even in my data packages, there are different data sets and you wouldn't want to load all of them probably. And so you probably want it to be lazy where it doesn't try to load all of those data sets into memory. But if your package is just one data set and the whole point is to use it, then probably you would want lazy load to be false. Um, I don't think I've ever done that. It, it's So the lazy data, it's funny, it's either true or um, like absent from the description entirely, I think. I don't, I'm sure, um, you know, I could probably set something up to go through and find some packages that have it explicitly set to false, but I don't know of any. Um, I tried, I'm trying to find an example of uh, uh, internal data in the tidyverse. Yeah, the data, the data pack, the data chapter mentioned some, but I have not looked into the internals. Uh, but, 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 but internal data, here we are. Ah, uh, yeah. So here are a couple use cases, I guess. Um, so I guess probably packages that deal with colors. Um, uh, these probably are tidyverse. We've got Google Drive and Google Sheets. Uh, this is the mm. use case I, I badly explained with because <laughs> I, I still don't fully understand it. Um, Maybe also like Palantir, or um, I guess we should fall into this this category. Um, Hadley's emoji. Uh, I guess there are a couple of emoji packages. There's one that Hadley has, and there's one that Demo has. Uh, maybe those would be cases where you have internal data. Okay. Do you guys find? I mean, I know I asked for examples that I could conceive <laughs> of, but do you guys find yourself doing it personally, making internal data? Okay. Uh, I. I definitely have, and I am having trouble thinking of exact use cases right now, but anything that like I want to reuse between different functions that even, you know, it might, um, I'm trying to think of a, an example, but it might be as simple as just like um, a flag that is uh, like, I just set something as true. And, you know, it, maybe I, I could have like a dev mode thing and I set it as false in this internal data, but have some things in my packages that reference dev mode and I could set it to true while I'm developing to test things. I, I don't think I've done that often, if at all. Um, here, yeah, okay. So, and this list that associates the keyword to the emoji would be uh, internal data. Although, uh, probably less. I think use. it's user exposed, or maybe there's a yeah. function that exposes it. Because I remember looking through when I was looking for yeah. a particular emoji. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, okay, that's fine. No, if it's yeah. not, if it's not a super common thing, that's helpful. I just wasn't sure if my brain wasn't. It's, it's comprehending. not. If it's not super common, super, that's that's a great answer. That works. It's not. It's not super uncommon, but it's one of those okay. things that, like, when you need it, you go, "Oh, okay, that makes sense." Okay. Um, I wait for that light bulb. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Thank trying you. to see if I can find one from my personal packages to just call out real quick, but um, so far, no luck. Uh, what is this? Um, yeah, okay. I have a, um, a package that like cleans up um, text and mm. I have internal data that um, is the definitions of different Unicode blocks of these are like Japanese characters and these are you know things like that that I need to use sometimes in different functions to be able to look things up. Um, and I didn't want to have to remember the IDs that they're at. And so I just 
um, within the functions, I call them by name and this internal data knows where they start, where they end. So that would be an example that it's something that I need to use um, in different places in my functions and I don't want to have to think about it too much, basically. Um, that's the kind of thing that tends to go into internal data for me. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, this, Rebecca, this is kind of a whole new world for me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, this is a different kind of prism through which to see some of the packages I, I, I've used in the past. I just thought, I just took for granted, oh, this is a cool thing that's made available to me, but I never really thought carefully about how. Um, but now, now I see, now I see the trick they used. Um, and yeah, so um, I guess that's it on on the data. Um, uh, I wanted to come to the use. Uh, actually, I'll skip ahead. Kind of the use R and use test. I think we touched on these really briefly in the past. Uh, but in effect, you know, when you're developing a package. Um, if if you can't be bothered to kind of go through the file system and create uh, create uh, you know like an R file that will contain your function or set of functions, this is something that does it for you. So basically, this use R, you can create the name of something. Uh, maybe I'll just do it. I've taken downloaded John's package uh, here, uh, just kind of uh, copy paste, um, and you could do use uh, use this uh, use R. Uh, hi. Uh, and so this will this will create um, this will create you know um, this will create this this um, uh, this file and and then open it open it with an R Studio uh, and here you can write whatever functions you please. Um, you know, we could do something like uh, hello. these things open on my computer. Come on, come on autocomplete. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. And, you know, just friends. You, uh, that's, you're in the args to the function. You, you need the- Oh, the oh, oh so, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. I haven't properly caffeinated today. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you could do this, and then you know, of course, if you wanted to create a test, um, uh, as 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 the console is kind of telling you, you could call use test to create a test, uh, you know, to discern whether you have the output that you expect from from this function, right? Um, so these are just kind of ways that might be helpful if you don't want to go navigating through the file system and and then you know create a new file here and populate it. You have a programmatic way to, to do so and have it open, I guess importantly, have it open in RStudio. RStudio is your, 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 chosen, your chosen IDE. Um, and going back and forth between the definition file and the test file is really where these functions are useful. That um, you know, if you run your tests and you are told that there's an error in this one test, it'll automatically open that test. But if you want to go to the R half of it, you can just use R and it'll load that file. Um, although uh, something, so if you're going trying to go from test to R, uh, and, and it you know it matches it by name, so it, it looks for uh, high dot R in the R folder versus test hyphen high dot R in the test folder. Um, something that's really useful that makes me not have to go. I'll almost never have to go from the test back to the R using these functions is F2 in R Studio. If you're on the name of a function, takes you to the definition of that function. Um, mm -hmm. That's like one of my favorite shortcuts. I use that all the time. You can use it with your own functions or with functions for packages. So if you're trying to see uh, how a function works, you can F2 your way through and if that function calls a function, you just F two on that one, and you know you can find your way through. That's uh, super useful. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the uh, the tip on F two, John. I I, <laughs> I only episodically use our studio the, these days for interactive things, and so I, I don't don't know my way around. That was that's a helpful tool that may draw me back to our to our studio. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Um, so, I mean, those are pretty straightforward. So that's on kind of creating, creating functions, creating tests. Um, uh, you know, after we've created some, some tests, probably the next, uh, sorry, uh, some functions and some tests, uh, during, during the process, you may want to uh, import some packages that you use inside of the test, uh, use inside of your function. Um, and here we've got, you know, use package, use dev package, which I think we've, we've, we've touched on. Um, we, I think we saw a use package. Uh, I guess the one that we didn't touch on, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit about, is, is use dev package. So the difference between these two, maybe there's more to it than this, but as I understand it, is use, uh, use package helps you um, import packages that are available on CRAN. Use dev package helps you import packages um, that you want to target that are in other package repositories, be that GitHub, GitLab, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, so you could kind of add, add those dependencies in a, in a certain way. I'll just, uh, this is by no means any, any publicity. Um, I'll just use one of my packages uh, that I have uh, and, and, and import it uh, and try to kind of explain what's going on. So I've got this use, um, use this, use dev packages, name of the package, and then you want to specify the remote. So by default, it kind of prepends the GitHub. Uh, but if you have GitLab or something like that, you can have GitLab. So it's kind of the remote, uh, two colons, and then the, the owner slash slash repo. Um, and then it'll install, uh, not install, but it'll, it'll uh, add, this, add this package uh, in the way that you would add other packages. So add it to the import. So here by default, it's imports. Um, and, uh, and then interestingly for, for this one, uh, which is a dev package. It's only available on, on, on GitHub. It adds it to the, um, oops. It adds it to the, uh, you get the remotes uh, added here. So kind of thinking of the, de the description is sort of your, your, your packages shopping list. Uh, it adds, <laughs> it adds which, which, which store to go to uh, in effect um, for, um, for, for a particular package. Uh, so that's a nice little, little function. Um, Right. Uh, so you can add whole packages uh, uh, in, in, in this way. Uh, there's another tool that I wasn't very familiar with until reading through the docs. And this is uh, one I initially scratched my head about, but I think I finally understood is import, uh, import, so use import from, uh, which allows you to kind of import a particular, well, ostensibly to import a particular function from a particular package. Uh, and what's interesting about this function is kind of the way in which it, it kind of declares the, the import. So let's say, uh, you know, coming back here, I'll just, I'll just add something uh, arbitrary, uh, you know, maybe I'll just uh, start with some, some Roxygen tags and, you know, import, um, uh, whoops, import from dplyr filter. And even though we're not using it, let's just declare it there. So I think typically, you, at least I, um, I don't know if every if other people work differently, but typically I will kind of declare my imports at the level of the functions. Uh, you know, I'll kind of write my function and then come back and document it with uh, with with Roxygen tags at the at the at the header. Um, uh, but uh, there's a there's a different way of doing things, which which this this function does, and that's you can import it. Um, and what this package will do will will it'll basically create for you. Uh, a package level documentation file, um, and then um, and then basically import uh, import things there. So rather than importing within within the individual functions, it, it kind of gives you a, a, like a global uh, thing. So just to show you how that looks, um, use this use um, import from uh, let's say uh, it's a package I know well. Tidyr. I can't type today. Uh, <laughs> function uh, a bit longer. Let's say. And so this creates uh, this this package level file. Um, uh, that's kind of this this placeholder R file um, that has the name of your package hyphen package dot R. So first it creates it creates that file modifies that file for you, adding the import there. So um, you'll, you'll see that the, the, the Roxygen import appears, appears here, right? In one centralized place rather than, um, rather than in the, 
uh, function definition files, if I can kind of call it that way. And it does all the traditional, you know, the things you might expect as well. Um, so it, it modifies uh, modifies your description file and then modifies your your namespace file. Uh, this is something new. I, I didn't I didn't understand uh, at first, but kind of a neat mechanism. I'll continue working the way that I work because it works for me at least for now. But uh, there there is an alternate path uh, if if it's one that you prefer. So the I I usually most of the time I just uh, or I fully qualify function calls rather than using import from. So just put use this colon or tidy r colon colon pivot longer in my function definitions. Um, but I, so I used this import, use import from just today because I'm making my package that is kind of a use this add-on package. And I wanted to import a whole long list of functions from use this that I'm going to use. And so I made a vector that was all of those functions and then used this uh, use import from, and you can give, you know, the packages use this and you can give the list of functions as a vector. And then it just made this and, you know, I don't know, keeps it nice. Um, it keeps it, it uh, will avoid duplication. So if you know you need to import something, you, you know, if you say, uh, if you just um, hit the up arrow and run this again, I'm pretty sure it's gonna basically not do anything. Yeah, because it's like, okay, that you've already done that. So you don't need to do it again. Um, so that that's nice. Uh, I don't know. I haven't used it much. Um, trying to think. I guess I've used the the one that we're we may or may not see in this uh, block here with the tidy eval stuff that does the same sort of thing. Um, oh yeah. yeah, I actually forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just for the so, so I guess now, I, you know, kind of the idea is add data, adding functions, adding uh, uh, you know, functions that you define in your package, adding dependencies through a few different means. Uh, now, now there, there are kind of a class of functions that appear actually under the, the rubric of package setup because they're kind of, I guess, they, they're one-time operations, if I could put it that way. Um, okay. uh, and, and they're kind of convenience functions where, where you can basically just import the way at least I view it and have internalized it is they're easy mechanisms to import things that keep that that uh, our developers commonly import into their packages. Um, so this is maybe not an exhaustive list of them, but uh, just to mention a few, uh, you know, use data table, which makes uh, the data table function from the data table package available to you. Uh, use pipe, which I think we touched on. Um, uh, during Jack's presentation um, uh, makes the migrator pipe available. Um, use tibble, which I just saw is actually now in questioning um, lifecycle, um, uh, makes, makes the tibble, makes tibble available for you in particular for kind of printing data, data frames uh, in your package. Uh, and then there's the uh, one I guess I'd completely forgotten about is uh, use tidy eval, uh, which actually I, I have not done this, but I, my, my expectation is that it would import uh, Arlang, basically, um, and maybe a few other things. Although, John, you, you seem to know more than I about yeah. that. Yeah, uh, it, it imports specific things from Arlang that you need okay. if you want to do the fancy Arlang uh, tidy eval stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess just that really the, the point the point of mentioning that is just to to kind of say that those those mechanisms are available for kind of common imports. Yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. Um, I know we talked about this, this is slightly off topic, but um, or a lot off topic, but you just mentioned the lifecycle <laughs> questioning. Um, and I know we talked on the lifecycle package, one of the earlier sessions. Is there a standard for um, how often it within the tidyverse they use those tags for functions um i saw in the news so we use almost exclusively sas at my in my workspace and um i saw in the news recently that um right sas was is being deprecated so i shared i mean they have a solution for it but they're like we're giving up on this solution so there's a different function that um 
write some similar SAS files, but they gave up on one kind of SAS file. Um, so I shared this with my coworkers yesterday and freaked them out because they're like, what is read SAS going to go away too? And I'm like, no, read SAS isn't going away. It's fine. It's core. Um, but I wanted to see that badge on the Haven package mm -hmm. somewhere and it wasn't. So is this some, I mean, I know that Haven is core Like I'm not actually worried. My gut is like read SAS is, is a stable function, but it doesn't have a lifecycle badge. So do you know when they try to use lifecycle badges for functions and when they don't care about them or? So I think Hadley gave a talk, was it the RStudio Global 2021? I think about okay. life cycles, if I'm not mistaken. No, still, I think that doesn't answer your question, <laughs> uh, but, but I think it kind of signals, I think mostly they use it to, my understanding is that they, they signal packages that are, um, that are experimental, uh, you shouldn't kind of rely on in production. So it's kind of, there's, you think it's kind of like a life cycle, but those that are entering kind of uh, you know, new packages that have yet to proven themselves, or rather new functions that have yet to proven themselves. And okay. then kind of on, on the outgoing ones, uh, uh, packages where, or sorry, functions where uh, either they're unsure, you know, the developers are unsure whether it's the best solution, uh, unsure whether it's useful, um, and, and then I guess, you know, deprecated where the things are going to, okay. going to be. So basically uh, yeah. absence in core tidyverse, absence of any flag probably means pretty stable and they use flags to indicate questioning status things. Uh, yes, if it's so first check the package itself to see if it has yeah. a life cycle. So, and Haven doesn't, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that they don't put stable on things like this, but I guess the fact that it's a version higher than one or one, one or higher means stable. That's true. Um, I forgot about that. Okay. Yeah. So they do use that. That's, so I was going to say the first piece is look at the version of the package. If it's less than one, then you could kind of consider everything experimental. Right. Um, and then after that, if it doesn't have a tag, so I guess if it doesn't have a tag, assume the tag on the function is the same as the package. If the package doesn't have a tag, use the version number okay. to kind of guide uh, stable versus experimental. I'm okay. kind of surprised, I guess maybe, um, I don't know if it has something to do with like the, culture of having these uh, life cycle tags is more of an R. Um, like, I don't know if they want, want to confuse people with the Haven um, package by putting stable on it and worry, make people assume too much or something. I don't know. I'm surprised they don't tag it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, now you've got me scared, Rebecca. I use a, uh, I use Stata on my workplace. We use Stata quite a lot. And I, uh... I'm a funny person. I, I like to use R to use Stata, um, <laughs> so or, or manipulate Stata data sets. Um, uh, so ho hopefully things don't don't, don't disappear. No, I, I guess think I think writing there, there is, is a like special the, the thing. The sassy verse, I think, uh, yeah. which maybe you could pick this up if 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 R Studio or Posit drops uh, drops support. I don't know. Well, they, they they really blamed SAS for not being open about what their data structure, their proprietary version is. And as SAS has, anyway, I'm not, it doesn't worry me. Don't worry yourself. <laughs> they they have a an explicit workaround, so it's fine. Got it, got it. Thank you guys for ex that explanation. Yeah. That's exp um, uh, that, just looking at the, um, the Haven docs, like they don't even use the experimental lifecycle tag. I know. Well, they combine they just, read and write into have. the same reference, though. Yeah. And then they they write that write SAS is experimental, yeah. and it's only been deprecated in the um, in the dev version so far. Okay. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Oh Thanks. yeah, like eighteen hours. It's front ago. and center. <laughs> so. Right. Um. Yeah. Um, I was going to, uh, I guess, just to, I'll mention it briefly. So that there are also kind of similar types of functions for uh, if you if your package needs to use uh, C or C plus plus. There, there are also um, single functions that allow you to kind of put in the the scaffolding need, scaffolding needed um, to uh, to use to use C and C C plus plus. So kind of creating creating the the SRC um, or sort well, the source directory and uh, you know. 
importing any 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 of the necessary packages to to make uh, you know whether it's you know, CPP eleven or RCPP uh, available for 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 doing those things. Um, I was I'll kind of going back again to my out of order very out of order presentation. Uh, I was going to kind of dive into two things that kind of caught my interest because they were new to me and maybe they're, they're new to you as well um, or new ish to me. Um, one is a uh, use our templates. So I think this is something I'm going to use an awful lot more. Uh, in future uh, than I have in the past. Um, and, and kind of the short version of it is that it, it creates for you an R Markdown template uh, that's, that's, uh, that you could kind of provision through your, your, uh, your, your package. So it does a lot of work for you. It kind of creates the scaffolding, the, this, uh, um, this um, uh, folder structure, it kind of puts the template in the proper spot creates a kind of a skeleton document, which is going to be uh, uh, your, your template. Um, uh, and then and then kind of populates the YAML file that basically describes within the RStudio IDE the thing, the, th the, the template that you're, you're going to use. Um, so actually I can, again, this is not at all to, to, to advertise, but it just so how I was looking for examples or thinking about examples. And I realized I actually have an example of, of stuff that I've done in the past. So I found myself, uh, creating some slides for a particular project um, with with Sharingan, and uh, I realized that it would probably be time saving if I created a template so that I and my collaborators could use the same kind of style uh, style tools and other tools within the Sharingan presentations to create all of these modules. And so basically, I used uh, you know used this to to create to create the this this template. So kind of looking down in the directory here, I have this this FTF slides uh, folder. I have uh, you'll, you'll see, uh, uh, you know, the skeleton, the skeleton file, which is basically a sharing in, a sharing in template that has kind of the, the sharing in parameters uh, that I like, uh, loads a couple packages that I find useful when making sharing in slides. Uh, and then behind the scenes uh, for sharing in, I'm also kind of providing as assets, uh, you know, some of the like, CSS, like uh, um, kind of custom CSS and a few PNG files that I would reuse. Uh, so this is kind of one, one use case. I'm sure there, 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 are, lots of, there are lots of them. Uh, but I thought this was a really cool tool. And actually one question that this kind of raises in my mind is whether something comparable exists for Cordo as yet. Um, I don't know if anyone happens to know. Maybe templates work differently in Cordo. I but my don't know yet. Yeah. Issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It should like it should all be possible. So I think they just haven't done it yet. I mean, I'm guessing in the worst Feature request cases, as of yeah. September 12th. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> oh, actually, the first one was as of August 9th. I guess for those who haven't used this particular feature, so I've got this layover, um, uh, overlay rather, it, you know, it makes possible. So if you if you load the package, so I'll just um, ah, can't type today. So I'll just load my package, uh, which I have installed locally. Uh, create a new file. Um, create a markdown file, and it simply makes available in this from template tab. It makes available this this template that I've created through the package, so I can you know create this and then it automatically creates, uh, this doesn't have any good place to be in, in, in this particular package, but it, it makes available this, this, this untitled RMD file that follows, follows your template. So it's a really cool feature. If you find yourself undertaking these kind of repeat actions uh, uh, like I was you know, with, with, uh, with, with RMD files. Um, yeah. Um, but one other thing I wanted to show, which is kind of similar in spirit and um, uh, yeah, similar in spirit is is the um, the, the add-ins, um, and 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 for this I I also kind of uh, want to dig a lot lot deeper. Um, is within you know within our studio. So let me just go back to motivate this. You you have this uh, add-ins uh, feature where you can kind of take some you know quick actions through add-ins or kind of keyboard key bindings, uh, keyboard shortcuts. Uh, that allow you to accomplish some some actions in, in, in the IDE, uh, so you can make those available as a as a package. The package can actually just consist entirely of of, of uh, our studio add-ins, uh, and to do that, you just uh, type this this function use add-in, and then it creates an add-in. Uh, it does this, the, this function does a few things for you. So it creates the ent directory if it doesn't already exist for your package, uh, an RStudio directory within that, um, and uh, or actually rather than 
waving my hands. Let me just uh, do the thing. All right. So you can see here it, it creates the the ends directory, which I didn't exist, uh, or sorry, creates RStudio directory within the ends directory, uh, populates it with so this file that it's just now open, which is a list of kind of uh, all of uh, all of your all of the add-ins that you're providing through your package, and then automatically provides a, a, a binding um, or, uh, to the function. So the presumption here, I guess, is that there exists in your package some function test that does something and who, whose action will be kind of triggered once uh, the user selects this 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 add in. Uh, but you know the name the name here is going to be the name that appears in the UI uh, of our studio when you're selecting you know when you're selecting the add ins uh, and the description likewise will will be there the binding is the binding to uh, the thing and then you know whether you want this binding to be kind of a, to be interactive or or or, or not. Um, yeah. Uh, some examples of this that I, I found kind of compelling, maybe some people are familiar with these, probably many are more familiar with these than I, um, uh, you know, data pasta, uh, this really nice add-in which allows you to kind of copy something that's structured uh, from, let's say, the web. Uh, actually, this, this nice little animated GIF shows it all. Copy it, paste it, and then it pastes into basically a nice, a nice tibble or tribble um, uh, format so you can kind of take some information from the web and, 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 and use it as your own. Uh, another uh, nice package. So this is kind of an add-in um, uh, that's, um, and, and there's like another flavor of add-in, which is uh, a, a widget, uh, kind of a shiny widget, an example of which is this nice package, uh, Esquisse, uh, which uh, allows users uh, who may not know uh, ggplot to kind of have this, this kind of wizard that guides them through the process of taking a data set, maybe performing some dplyr actions on it, and then creating as an output and interactively a ggplot corresponding to that. Uh, and then alongside this, uh, you can actually see the, the code um, that would recover, you know, you would have you would have composed to, to get the same the same result. Yeah. Um, and actually, for, for this, I have one question for the group. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm looking to, to John, who I, I presume <laughs> has more experience in this area. Is is um, are snippets uh, provided through the same um, this this kind of same mechanism? So I'm thinking, for example, like shiny snippets. Um, I, ideas that you let's say you open your R, you open you know um, uh, an R file. Um, and then, you know, as you can see here, you start typing something, and then it, it kind of provides you an autocomplete within um, within um, you know the R R Studio IDE. Is this provisioned through through add-ins, or is this some other mechanism? Uh, it is its own thing within R Studio. Okay. There is, if you go to Tools, there's Edit Code Snippets. I do not use these nearly enough. Um, it's like uh, just yeah. a, okay. a like a a list of things, um, like they're super useful, and I use a few of the ones that exist, but I not nearly enough. Um, it's something I want to get in the habit of doing more, and then creating more because there are definitely things that I type all the time that I'm sure I you know, like. A, there's I, I learned today that there is a function um, code snippet. So if you type fun in our studio and then enter, it creates the um, skeleton of a function and then you can um, tab through to the different pieces. It'll save a few seconds, but you know, a few seconds is, is more than nothing. Um, yeah. You and I do seconds multiplied by the number of times you use it ends up being could well end up being a lot of time. Yeah. Right. And so that's one, you know, obvious like I write functions all the time. And I have never used that snippet until someone asked about stuff today um, on our studio. I mean on our for DS. So um yeah, that's something I want to get better about. And I don't know, uh I, I just I simply don't know if there are packages that help with that, if there are ways to like um, create more, if you can create more snippets programmatically, 
Um, yeah, the, the doc the documentation. I don't know if it's just being loose with jargon, but um, uh, let's see. I think it did mention snippets, and so so in the in, in the in the you know documentation for the add-in function, there's a link to the RStudio add-in, and they mentioned kind of a few different entities. So one is uh, like an add-in that I guess would be shown as you know an idea IDE was an add-in. Uh, you've got these uh, 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 they call them uh, widgets. Uh, you know, Eskis was one that I showed, and then key bindings, but they also mentioned snippets. Um, although maybe maybe I just Googled through here and they're using it in a particular a particular way. Um, yeah. But maybe I think they are um not referring to the snippets that are within our studio, but rather the concept of a snippet, I think. Got it. But I don't know. Yeah, I don't I think, know. I think you're right. No, I think yeah. you're right, because they do mention talking about like the, um, you know, having being able to have a keyboard shortcut that would allow you to, you know, um, quickly type some operators. Uh, uh, um, like, for example, the N operator, insert the N operator here, like, let's say you, you, you link it to some keyboard shortcuts so that you can more quickly type type this, right? So it's, a, it's through the add ins, but it, it deploys, I guess, air quotes, a snippet. But it's not a snippet in the sense of what what you know what I showed with tight, with the shiny shiny snippets. Right. Yeah, I don't I'll know. Look at the um, source code to see how they do yeah. it. Uh, that's a, that's that's kind of a point of interest. Then, like, I wonder too if it's something where there's a corresponding use of this function. Maybe maybe not. Right. I so I'm I very briefly looked at the R Studio. Um, uh, what is the the name of this package? Our Studio API. Our Studio API. Yeah. And I don't see any mention of snippets within the help for our Studio API. Just on a quick, quick look. And so, um, yeah, I don't think we can do anything programmatic with them. Maybe, but nothing that maybe I can see. Maybe it's just maybe maybe the functions are actually just pulling it from the snippets file in the text folder. I'll, I'll have to look into oh. this. Uh... Yeah. So here, I guess these are these are named snippets. Uh, I guess it's somehow a list. Um, yes. There must be there must be a function that that sort of instantiates oh. them in, in, in the active in the active. Um, I, I still think. Okay. Dot r slash snippets. Um, or okay. Yeah, I wonder. I'll have to play with that to see. Uh, oh, I'll bet. Yeah, I'll bet if I write my own snippets. Yeah, just got to figure out where, if I make my own snippets, where do they save? Yeah, so I think it's, I think it's at, at uh, maybe it's like an R profile because there's this use this. Um, I started looking at this briefly. Or, uh, edit, that was edit, edit R snip. Edit R snippets. Um, Oh, interesting. You can deploy to different types. Uh, and then opens a file, um, which I guess is, well, I'm on, I'm on Windows. Um, looks like it's in the app data for, for our studio. I don't okay. know if it persists there or I mean, presumably it does. For Mac and Linux, I'm not sure where it goes. Etsy directory or so, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna have to play with that later and see, cause like I said, you know, it's coming up twice today, uh, semi-independently, and it's something that I need to use more often. Rebecca asked so, so, in the so chat, um, if everyone uses our studio, I do. Um, I have tried to get into using VS Code and it didn't like it took too much work to get to it. Or I love our studio. Like convince if I if it takes work to switch, then I'm not gonna do it unless you convince me I should. Copilot is a strong argument, but now there's the GPT studio and GPT tools packages huh. that um interface with chat. Well, with G they they throw around chat GPT a lot, but really it's GPT three that they're interfacing with. Um, 
and actually i've been i've been playing with chat gpt quite a bit as kind of a uh co-pilot where i will just like have a little conversation with it about something that i'm trying to uh write it's I don't know. People like go on and on about how awesome it is. If you're writing something that people have already written, it's pretty good. <laughs> but then there's no point in you writing it. It is pretty bad at actually writing a function that's actually going to work, but it does a pretty good job of kind of getting me on a path that I might not have found otherwise. Um, but it's really funny. Like it doesn't know argument. I mean, I guess in other programming languages, it might be better about this, but it makes up arguments. Um, and yeah, chat. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, for reg, for regex, chat GPT is apparently amazing. I haven't tried it yet, but I've seen lots of people talk about that. Um, but it'll, it'll like make up arguments to functions. Like, um, I don't know. I was doing something with, uh, uh, shiny modules and it was like it was making up arguments to module server that aren't actual arguments but it's like well it should be <laughs> you know like it didn't say that but it's it, it made sense i was like oh wow that argument's there let me no nope, that argument is not there it's just it would make life easier if it were um so i don't know i just do that in a browser window separate from our studio kind of uh and then come you know copy paste or not depending on what comes up but i have been using it um, somewhat successfully. One of the main things I use it for is um, like, it'll help clean up code. You can feed it quite, quite a lot of code and it'll kind of understand it. And if it gets something wrong, then that's a sign to me that uh, something is confusing here. And so like I use it to kind of go back and forth that way. And it has found some things to optimize or it'd be like, hey, you do this, four times within that code, maybe write it off, uh, write it as its own function or things like that. So um, that so Copilot was the reason that I was looking into doing BS code. And now I've got a whole system um, without, yeah, with still working within our studio. So, um, all right. So for next week, I went ahead and signed myself up to finally do what I've been saying I'm going to do of going through these last th three sessions, finding what we have not covered from these blocks that we've mostly covered um, and go through that. So it might end up being a short week, but if so, I'll go through. Um, by then I will have done, uh, will have finished my uh, personal package, which is currently called and this because it's used this and this. Um, and uh it's just like little it's add-ons for this package development stuff to do all the stuff that i want to do um in the order that i want to do it without being our studio and slash a member of the tiny tidyverse team um okay and yeah why did thank you have you, to take such a great name john <laughs> well it's i do not intend to publish this one at all because it's like it fills in my email address and things like that now maybe i'll generalize it and uh go from there but right now it's it's all very specific like it creates uh packages within r4ds by default or i can say i can set that to false to create it within my own yeah you know, things like that um so yeah i'll probably go through that and show like what's in there and why um and it's it was stuff that used to all be in my r profile and my r profile was starting to get huge. Um, so I decided I'll just make a separate package and then library okay. that package in my R profile. Um, all right. Please, uh, okay. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs>